Today, Holy Mother Church takes us back to the beginning to be reminded of who we are, who we were made to be, and especially for those of you who are married, what your marriage is meant to be in Christ. The first reading starts with God saying, it is not good for the man to be alone. Of course, this has implications as we will see for marriage, but this also speaks to who we are as human beings made in the image and likeness of God. None of us is meant to be alone. Not one of us can do it by ourselves. First, we need God, of course, who as a communion of persons, wants us to share in that communion in this life with others as well. Communion of the saints, the communion of those around us. But then this particular passage goes further to show that man needs woman as well, especially in the sacrament of marriage. So God continues, I will make a help for him. This particular word, help, seems very simple in English, but in the Old Testament, the word that was used in Hebrew was only used for something that would be given from God or a king to someone below. It was never used for help to someone on equal terms, much less receiving help from an inferior. So this means, for all of you husbands, that your wife was given to you as a grace from above, that you might not be alone, but that you might be helped and supported all the days of your life in a godly way. But God knows Adam needs to be formed a bit before this. So he begins to parade before him all of the animals and the birds. And it's not as if God is trying to find the right one. He knows what his plan is. But Adam needs to realize none of these animals are like me. Now, for us, we're used to these animals, but Adam has just been created. He needs to see that the cow and the dog and the sheep and the goat and whatever else there is, these are not like him. They will not bring fulfillment. They may be able to help him in a simple way, tilling the fields or whatever it might be, but they are not a help, a partner to him. And so once this has been done and Adam has named all of these animals, God puts him to sleep and takes out a rib from his side. Already we can see that God is planning that man and woman be of equal dignity. John Paul and other saints point this out, that Eve was not taken from his foot so that Adam could trample upon her, nor was she taken from his head so as only to be on an intellectual relationship. Rather, she was taken from his side, right next to his heart, so that together, side by side, they might walk in equal dignity and worthiness. Now we know from our daily relationships that men and women are very, very different, almost in every way. But this passage shows that they are equal in dignity. And this is essential, especially in re the relationship of marriage, to remember that equal dignity of the other. Then there's another interesting phrase. The Lord God built up in into a woman the rib taken from the man. Again, this particular word built up in Hebrew isn't like we would build a kneeler or a pew or construct a house. This word was only used for the construction of the temple, meaning that God from the temple of the man's body is building a temple of the woman's body. This again shows the great worth and dignity that both the man and the woman are meant to be dwelling places of the Most High where God himself comes to stay, remain, inhabit. This is why elsewhere in the book of Genesis, before they are kicked out of Eden, we see man and woman walking with God in the evening cool. That they are together, peacefully, dwelling with one another. And this particular word shows that. God makes them to be with them. And then they are meant to respect each other. When Adam arises from his sleep, he sees the woman... And we hear his first words. We know he's said other words. He's named the animals. But here the first words that are recorded are, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. These are not just passing words. It's the first poetry of the Bible. And it's covenant language. Adam is entering into covenant with Eve. Now, we've talked before in other contexts that a covenant is not just a contract that can be broken. It's a permanent union. And Adam is recognizing, just as God has made a covenant with man by creation, 
Adam is now extending that to his wife. And their covenant is an image, an extension of what God has entered into with us. And it cannot be broken. Already we see a glimpse of what will later come in the gospel, that marriage is forever. Till death do us part, as the vows say. It cannot be ended in this life. This is why a man leaves his father and cl mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. They become one, unified. They are whole with each other. All of this is in the background as Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. They come and say, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? In the Gospel of Matthew, they take it a step further. Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife for any reason? And this gets to the different arguments that were being had at the time by different rabbis. Some of the more conservative would say you can only divorce if there's adultery or harm being done. And that's similar today. No one needs to stay in a dangerous relationship. But on the other side of it, there was one rabbi that said, you can divorce her for whatever reason. If you didn't like the way she made lunch, get another wife. Of course, that's absurd, because this flies in the face of what God has for marriage. And Jesus points this out. They're all claiming, Moses allowed this. And he says, but God did not. Moses allowed it out of the hardness of your hearts. He saw you could not live up to this commandment. So he allowed this so something worse wouldn't happen. But in the beginning, in the reading we just heard, it was not so. God made them male and female. He leaves father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one. Now Jesus doesn't stop there. He takes his disciples into the house and begins to explain even further. We have established already that marriage is lifelong. It's indissoluble. It cannot be separated. What God has joined, man cannot separate, no matter what courts say. But Jesus says there's something further. That if this happens, if there's divorce and remarriage, it's adultery. It breaks further commandments of God. Because this marriage, this covenant, is not something that can be thrown away. He then takes it even further, and this particularly pertains to so much of what we see in the world today. For the third week in a row, we see Jesus bring a child into their midst and say, let the children come to me. The kingdom belongs to such as these. Now, out of this context, we can still take these words to know that children are meant to be part of our family in this parish. It's why we have a school, to allow children to come to Christ in the sacraments and in their formation. It's why we try to educate the parents to help their children to do the same. But beyond this, given the context, we see that Jesus is saying these children are part of married life. They are part of that covenant. And just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share that love in community, so too, in the sacrament of marriage, if God allows, there is to be the offspring of children. There is to be that shared love which brings forth new life and allows the covenant and the life of Christ to continue in this world by the new children. And then they go and continue on down the road through generation after generation. This is why, among other reasons, the church doesn't allow for divorce or adultery, why the church outlaws contraception and sterilization and abortion, because these either work against life or destroy it. You know, I was amazed this last week, thinking about all these things that we hold that the world does not. And the Catholic Church really is the last institution that holds that divorce and remarriage is against the Bible. Ever since Henry VIII, every Protestant denomination has found some way to say it's okay, out of misguided love. And then in the world, there was even a headline this week that the Prime Minister of Brussels, I think it was, couldn't understand why Pope Francis would say abortion is murder. That's how far it's gone down the road. That people don't even expect the church to hold to her teachings. But for us, we must continue to proclaim it. And just as Pope Francis said, yes, this is murder, this cannot be done, no matter what democracy says, we too must hold to Christ. Everything he teaches, everything he reveals, everything the church gives us is for our salvation. It's for our good. And today, as Our Lady of Fatima said, this battle is in marriage and the family. 
That's for most of you here. You are living in the world, in a world which does not want us to exist, in a world which does not want this good and wholesome truth because it stands opposed to us. And yet for us, we must stay in this truth. Otherwise, we will fall to the world and be swept downstream to nowhere good. So for you families, these readings give you an opportunity to reflect. Husbands, do you treat your wives as a temple, as one who was built up by God as a help for you, as a grace? Do you cherish her and love her, supporting her so that she may become a saint? And wives, do you look to your husband as the one God has given you to lead you, to be strong for you, to help you along that way to sanctity as well? A few weeks ago, we talked about this with St. Paul's reading, one of the more controversial ones unnecessarily, that the man is meant to lead, to be the head of the family, and the woman is meant to be the heart of the family. Now, as you can imagine, nobody can live without head or heart, and so too in the family. Both are needed to carry this domestic church, this little church, forward in communion with God. The more that is lived out, the more the love of God is made manifest in your relationships, in your families, in your households. By the sacrament of marriage, you're a walking sacrament, presenting to all the world, even if it's just going to the store with your children, that God's love is among us and able to do wonderful, powerful things, despite what the world has to say. To aid you in this, I would encourage you, especially in this month of the rosary, if you're not already doing this, take up a family rosary daily. Pray the rosary as a family. What Father Peyton said decades ago still stands, and we see proof of it all the time. The family that prays together stays together. Because that invites God into your life, so you're not trying to do it by yourself. Now I understand, especially if you have small kids, it may not always be the prettiest rosary. It may not be the most meditative, but it instructs the children. And over and over they learn. And even if they come in and go out and sit upside down on the couch to pray with you, they're with you, and you can still pray with them. For those of you who are not married, if you have a different vocation, pray that we all support married life and family life, that we stand up for life in general, because especially as we see the world falling apart, this is attacked. But we can stand strong in our faith, knowing that through our vocations, through those families around us, through the mutual support that God has given all of us so that we are not alone, we together, as a church, as a parish, as a community, can be drawn into that love of God, which is shown especially in this world through marriage, and become saints together. Pray for this end. Pray for each other. Pray for those that are struggling in their marriages, for those that are suffering, perhaps for not being able to conceive. Whatever the case may be, pray for these people. Pray for yourselves. Pray for all of us, that we can enter into these glorious mysteries that Christ has given us, live them in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and ultimately in the end, be drawn to heaven forever.